Hello and welcome back to Speak. Uh, so today our guest is Greg Smith. And as I just said before we started recording, I'm going to stay cool, calm and collected and not fucking fangirl all over the place. So, <laughs> Greg, if you'd like to give an intro to yourself and give us an idea of what is the topic that you wanted to speak about. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, first of all, uh, so I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm an Australian lawyer, enjoying the cricket tremendously at the moment. Um, if if others are not, I don't care. Um, <laughs> that's been a lot of fun. Um, I wrote a book called Paper Safe, which a, a few people have found interesting over the years. Um, and I, I actually reached out because I love listening to this podcast and I love what you two ladies do. I think it's absolutely brilliant and um I just wanted an opportunity to come and chat. And um, it's really about my, I have a concern um, building off the back of Paper Safe, which talks very much about a disconnect between purpose and process mm. and that we do a whole, whole lot of things that might be a really good idea. But at the end of the day, we end up chasing metrics and, and process. And we, we don't know if our, we don't know if the things that we do work. And I am, um, I'm kind of safety agnostic between safety one and safety two as a lawyer. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to try and pin down labels. Um, as a human being, I'm kind of leaning a bit more naturally towards safety two because I think it's nice to be treated like a person and have a conversation with people. As a lawyer, I'm agnostic because the courts don't care what you do just so long as it works, right? Yeah. My fear is, and I, I've seen this, so I've, been doing this for more than 30 years now um, to show my age, but I've lived through the whole safety culture thing where safety culture comes spinning out of Chernobyl. We introduced that into the safety lexicon for the first time in the late eighties, early nineties. And all of a sudden everybody's about safety culture. And it's been, I don't know if it's been an unmitigated disaster, but there are pockets of disaster that have spun off safety culture. And I feel like we're going exactly the same way with new view. Um, and I think, not to put it too coldly, I think one of the poster children for that concern is what we're seeing out of things like the due diligence index, um, where we are, we're relabeling things around capabilities and capacities and resilience, and we're putting exactly the same metrics on them. Mm. And we're counting the metrics and not counting the effectiveness. Mm. So that's that's kind of why I reached out and said, I think this is worth talking about. We would love to hear your two views because you bring such different perspectives to it. Um, yep. And then there's a few other things I think that are bouncing around the place at the moment that are worth thinking about in this idea of keeping people free from harm, for want of a better term. Mm. Oh, yeah, I'll definitely uh, write that down because it's one of the, the zero harm things. Are that hilarious? Is or that free, like, freedom from harm and zero harm. I think there's different ways to explain it mm, yeah and like zero zero harm is one of those things where you can be agnostic as well mm. like i don't like the <laughs> phrase personally well yeah, yeah i know you throw i don't like the phrase yeah whenever i see the thing really what sits behind that yeah i know there are people um some psychologists and sociologists who'll say just the use of that term mm. does harm yeah that's fine i accept their technical expertise mm. as a lawyer it's like well we know there's a body of evidence that says it's problematic we know there's a body of evidence that says it might have some benefits in some circumstances how do you prove that it works for your organization and doesn't cause harm and that that's the missing question i see in so much of what we do in safety how yeah. do we know it works yeah we just do shit yeah we just how do we know it works? It's um because even with the like the due diligence in like in any of these kind of things that are coming out, um I think people really do want they're grappling for like, yes, this is the thing. Like finally we have the thing. Um, and so I think that's why people reach for it so quickly. And then for like we'll say I read that um you did an article on this a couple of weeks ago. Um yep. Greg and I read it and I was like fuck sick Greg <laughs> because I was like yay due diligence 
index and then I read your thing I was like well you're after pulling the fucking rug out from under that now and and while I agreed with a lot of the points you made on it I was still just like oh fuck are we ever going to get the answer and I know there's no one answer and there's no silver bullet but yeah. it did I, I suppose it felt like we were kind of going in the right direction and 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 if we're not, it's like, well, what are we doing? And there is definitely that kind of. Well, always... these are my thoughts at the moment. If you're interested, that's kind of, it's uh, everywhere. Yeah. There's two things they say in the due diligence index paper, which I think are worth paying attention to. They, and this is in the context of worker insights. Um, if mm-hmm. you're interested, it's on, it's on page 15 of 49. Okay, the fact that we need 49 pages to explain it, problematic, but it's on <laughs> page 15 of 49. Um, asset, assessment of the effectiveness of close out of worker insights must include consideration of whether those worker insights are leading to better health and safety performance in the organisation, right? If we knew how to assess whether our safety initiatives were leading to better health and safety performance, we wouldn't need a due diligence index. Yeah. If we knew how to do that. So they're saying, do all of this bureaucracy, introduce this system, Put a put a um, a quiz or a, a survey on top of it. So do all of that, but you still have to work out if it's leading to better health and safety performance. Mm. Which is what all right. And then think this and are buying into the due diligence, due diligence index for. We think that's supposed to be helping us realise whether we're doing stuff that matters or is helpful, right? But yet embedded in the wording, you're saying it's saying just go and you should have sussed that bit out already. Well, if we could do that, we wouldn't need it. Yeah. Because <laughs> they go on later to say organisations are encouraged to provide reporting commentary with respect to the processes for how they are assessing the effectiveness of the closeout of worker insights. And then it goes on, uh, da, 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 da. worker insights are being implemented and are effective and fit for purpose. Now, if you just tacked those words on the end of anything that you do for safety being implemented and are effective and fit for purpose and you could demonstrate that yeah what else is there to do right yeah which which is what i thought the due diligence index was designed to do but it doesn't in my view Mm. so i think it's one of those problematic things and it also speaks very strongly to me and we kind of mentioned this before um it really does illustrate this socioeconomic problem we have in safety. That if you're a big organisation with lots of resources, you can pile onto something like this. Um, you bury this bricklayer out the back of nowhere. Who's doing all of this? Who's coming up with your surveys to find out if if your workers are net contributors or net detractors of your safety message? Say. Um, what is it? It's a. There's a lot going. I think there's too much going on. And we've again, we've lost track of the fundamentals. Yeah. And I think there's a reason for that. Safety. Safety is a wicked problem. I think it's one of the archetypal wicked problems. It doesn't. To to your point, Lisa, it doesn't have a solution. Mm. Certainly doesn't have a metric. It doesn't have a number. Um. We don't know if our solutions create more problems. There's all sorts of work around wicked problems. So safety is a wicked problem. Safety regulation is linear and simple. Mm-hmm. You know the hazards in your business. Also, you know your activities that your business does. You know the hazards from the business. Have you risk assessed them? Have you come up with controls? Have you implemented the controls? And do you do some sort of review and improvement process? Linear and simple. Yeah. So, but as soon as you try and do the linear and simple, it just turns to custard in in like five seconds flat. And I don't know, worker insights are another label of a safety conversation or a safe act observation or a leadership walk around or a blah, blah, blah. blah. It's all the same stuff. You want to go out and talk to your people, which is a great idea, right? Talk to your people. Just don't say, oh, and by the way, complete this form while you do it. Yeah. Just fucking talk to people. Yeah. How's it going? What's happening? Yeah, um, that's me being ranty. So, so. Um, I've got a whole load of, um, and I, I like the fact, we spoke about this before, that I've not dug into any of your stuff before, Greg. So 
I used to go on a call with Elisa, a Project Miletium call, and very often for these new ideas and new promises, I'd sit in the background and I'd just suck in information. And it was really nice to have quite organic idea yep. flow. So listening to you talk about those things, and I was sort of, I've been scribbling away, and I don't usually do this on here. But I think what you've made me think about is um, the, you know, safety culture work, the safety one, safety two work, the new view work, the, the DD index, all of that stuff. So many of us get fixated on how much work has gone into them and we wait for them and we want them to have the answer. And actually, mm. I don't really think we know what we what we mean by the answer, the answer to what? Because harm is inevitable when you have a planet full of people doing a planet full of things um, in different ways, in different moods, with different, you know, levels of sleep, anxiety, stress, um, you know environments cultures management styles like it's and it's going to happen so what is the answer that we are looking for is it to how do we have no harm because that's not real and then the other thing i was thinking of is we get these books or we get these papers or these massive indexes we've waited for and inevitably it tells us to do the same thing that we should have always just been focusing on which is should you want to just go and talk to the dude that is closest to the harm and say Tell me about a time that it nearly went very wrong. What happened, mate? What did you do to get around that? Tell us about a document that was garbage when we put it out. Who's writing your documentation? Is it designed effectively? Or actually to really focus on not just the negative, not just the reactive stuff, but really get down and do the job with the people and say, you know, how do you make success happen every single day? Show me the best way to do what yep. you do and trust the people that are the risk owners um, and then design and measure that like what are the good outcomes how do we make it happen and what, how often are we tweaking something to come away from what we've designed on paper to what the individual says is the right thing to do um and I think we myself Elisa and a group of us in Ireland once had a really good conversation and I was just like I just don't like picking up a book and thinking it's going to be my answer a I'm dyslexic so mm. reading is a chore but I like to feel like, I love to feel like my answer, my answer question to Elisa and to all the other people that read the books is like, what worked? What did you get from it that was like mega and did a thing that you're excited about? That's the bit I want to know. I want to know what happened, what was positive, how did we change something? Um, and I think that's what good safety work is. But a due diligence index that says, just go and do, just go and do a check that we, this was supposed to be the check for. It's it's important. I think I think due diligence index is a bit a bit more complicated than that, but he, as I say, hidden in the in the guts of it is this core. How do we know that what we do is implemented and effective? Mm. Um, now, I think we struggle. I, I, I'm not quite sure we do a very good job of defining what effective means. Yes, and, and in part, that's that's the nature of the beast. So, what is an effective safety conversation? Yeah, I I, I don't know. And you, yes, you can you can do a you can do a you can do a double blind survey afterwards. And if everybody says it was a good conversation, it might be a good conversation. Okay, but none of the parties involved in the conversation might have had the first clue about the safety issues associated with the work. Yeah, it could be a. Ter I've had lots of terrific conversations about topics that I know three fifths of absolute fuck all about. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't mean I'm contributing to the to that particular topic. Yeah, I'm just having a great conversation. <laughs> just having a so, great chat. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. And you know, you 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 we're actually seeing this. I think, um, you know, one of the one of the one of the areas where I think we're seeing this danger coming is things like learning teams. We had a great learning team. Don't break my heart, Greg. I fucking love learning teams. Don't do it. <laughs> I, I look, I think they're tremendous. Oh, look, again. <laughs> As I said at the outset, I'm kind of agnostic about a lot of things in safety, all right? I think you can have a tremendous safety conversation and you can have a shit one. Yeah. You could have a wonderful learning team and you can have an awful one. You can have a brilliant safety culture survey and you can have a manipulated crap one, mm -hmm. all right? So what's the, what's the distinction? What's happening in your workplace? And what is it contributing? What's the contribution on two levels? One at the micro level. So if you're having safety conversations, are they working at a micro level? Are they achieving the outcome they're designed to achieve? 
what's their contribution to a macro level? What's the what's the safety outcome for the organization? How do you define that? What does it look like? Because yeah. apparently we can't use injury rate data, even though that's what, how everybody measures everything. And it's there's a there's a complexity. I I'm a I've always been and you'll know this. It's in the book. I'm a, I'm not a fan of injury rate data as a measure of every, anything. Mm. It should be a prompt to ask questions. Yep. I think I think there's a place for it. Yeah. I don't think there's too many. And again, if you, 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 so someone I admire in safety who's very divisive is Dr. Robert Long, right? Very divisive character. Um, I enjoy his company. I enjoy conversations with Rob. I've learned a lot from Rob over the years, very divisive, but he has very much stronger views about what is right and wrong in safety. I have much less strong views. I just want people to say to me, this is what we do. This is why we do it. This is how we know it works. Yeah. And that's always the missing thing for me. Now, um, I also appreciate that I see it from a very simplistic end of the conversation. So there's a dead body on the ground. I get the telephone call. What do the regulators want to see? They want to see the training records. They want to see the safe work procedures. And they want to see whatever risk assessment tools were filled in by the worker. And 90% of prosecutions come out of those three documents. Yeah. No one's talking about safety culture. Nobody's talking about conversations. No one's talking about trust. They're not talking about that. All of those things, and I, this is some of the stuff I sent earlier, they're all enablers to the mechanics of achieving the outcome. Mm. So... Behavioural-based safety is an enabler to, to help inform a mechanic to achieve an outcome. Um, you can put 40 maintenance fitters in a room and make them all draw pictures of their hands and say, what couldn't you do if you lost two of your fingers? To try and get an emotional attachment to it. Don't look at me like that. It <laughs> might happen. All right. <laughs> Go on. You know it happens. All right. Keep going. Fucking hell. And, then, and then you could and then you could publish a paper 12 months later to say we reduced hand injuries by 80%. And then someone would fall through a skylight and you'd be prosecuted and no one would give a shit about your hand safety program. So it's what are we paying attention to? Hmm. What matters? I think lots of people are doing lots of really good stuff. I don't yeah. doubt that for a moment. And in most yeah, most well resourced organisations, we're not killing lots of people all the time. So we've made huge, huge advances. Huge advances. Um, I really like that framing, by the way, Greg. I just I thought that was um, if you were going to like boil down a really good approach. I think some of the people that listen to this podcast are like brand new in, going in, been for ages, like all different points of their career. But that, what are you paying attention to? And then what matters? Not looking at them initially, like look at them as two completely separate questions and see if they match each other. Like, what are you paying attention to? That's the endless stats, the major appendices and documents, like bloody hell. And then what really matters? Separate question, fresh mindset, what matters? Does one touch the other? Uh, and I actually would put, put my hand on heart and say lots and lots of organisations they wouldn't touch. Because what really matters... And, you know, probably not a sexy thing to say um, in terms of health and safety, but from, from our perspective, from my perspective, what really matters, I genuinely think everyone deserves to get home and nobody deserves to forfeit their health, safety, mobility, ability, anything for a paycheck. That's just sure everybody's right. The second sure. part of that is the organisation that is employing me is doing that to make sure that we are optimum that we're productive, that we are commercially viable, all these great things that come from great people on the park uninjured, right? Yep. What really matters, and are we paying attention to those things? I just don't, um, on, on most occasions where I talk to people, specifically around, and I've covered it in another podcast, I think, um, about true cost of harm. If you're really talking about getting everybody home and then the its impact on the commercials, how you're a genuine business entity, no one's really piecing those things together. It's just we're just seen as an expenditure in the business 
That's why we're driven by numbers and it's it doesn't help anything. So I really like those two frames. And I hope that if anyone takes that away and they're thinking, I think we need a bit of a reset to look at those. What are you paying attention to? And what really matters and do they pair? I really like that. Yeah, I, look, I think I think we struggle. Um, I think we struggle to put a box around the cost of of um, safety when it goes wrong. Yeah, I, I really think we do. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm going to sound like a prick now, and I don't mean to be, but it's a safe space. You know, there's space lots of good. Offer. Say again. I said it's a Too safe late? space. <laughs> okay. Um. So there's lots of people running around um, with a lot of compassion and care in their heart for workers and they don't want them to get injured, all right? Kudos to them. I think that's a great idea. My, my working career has been sitting in little rooms with um, the managers of those people. Yeah. And they're, and, and we've, we've created this um, super unhelpful um, black hat version of employers that says... Whenever a worker is killed or injured at work, there is some overly capitalist bastard sitting behind that who has no care or compassion for their workers at all and was just out to make a fat, fast buck and didn't care. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Now, again, there there is no clear dividing line here. Are there are there employers in the system who have done that? I, I suspect there probably are. I suspect there probably are. But most of the most of the workers, most of the managers that I deal with. Um, are not like that. They are genuinely devastated about any level of workplace accident they have. Yeah. But um, you know what? They've got a lot of shit on their plate. Mm -hmm. You know, we are perfectly happy to say as a society, well, no, probably not because I don't think society cares that much. Um, the echo chamber of safety too is perfectly happy to say it's not the worker making the mistake, it's the environment that we created for them. All right? Nobody is saying, what about the environment we're creating for the businesses to operate in? Yeah. Because that's as big a fact, that's as big a factor as anywhere else. There are plenty of plenty of business owners, business owners who don't pay themselves so their workers get a paycheck. We know that that happens. Mm -hmm. So I think we need a bit more empathy and compassion all around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really complex, it's a really difficult situation, but we don't help ourselves. Um, you know, like the Bradley curve, these these social behaviour, these um, safety curves we put ourselves on, right? And we end up measuring our position on the safety curve. So we run surveys and we invest all this money and we say we have moved from, I, I don't know what the technical terms are, you know, but from degenerate to... Bloody, it's probably Mature. not the right word. Let's, okay, <laughs> not the right word. From someone low on the curve to somebody in the middle of the curve. Yeah. Right. And interestingly, the middle of the curve normally involves lawyers, so you know, low moral base kind of thing. Um, and we measure that, and we say to the board, safety is good because we're moving up the curve. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, are our chemicals contained? Do our people know about working at heights? Do they have the resources they need? Are they trained? Do they speak English? Do they? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lack of focus, and I I think again it's hard to tell because safety. And I've I've had this conversation with a few people. I love these conversations; they're really interesting. But it's a pretty small echo chamber. There's a lot of people out there who wouldn't even know the legislation exists, much less that there is this academic debate about how the principles apply and how to have a conversation to people. Um, I, I'm I'm in um, semi-rural Western Australia. So I'm about now south of Perth. We've got three and a half acres. And there's a, um, a pub about two kilometres away called the Stud Country Tavern. Um, and that was not named in my honour when I moved um, <laughs> into the district. Shock. There's a lot of stud. There's a lot of stud farming that goes on here, and I was I, I sometimes when I work at home I'll slip down there for a pint and have a burger and just you know that's where I do my best work. And I'm sitting around in a booth and there's four blokes and two women sitting at the bar 
all in high vis, all having a beer at lunchtime. I don't know where they're going to work or if they're knocking off. And the the S word slipped out, the safety word. And it was just rampant. You're responsible for your safety. If you get hurt, you're as dumb as all part. And it and I'm just sitting there thinking, yep. Yep, we got a long, long way to go. <laughs> long, long way to go. To your point, uh, to both of your point in terms of the almost inevitability of of harm in some circumstances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like there's there is a huge way to go. And it's not just like there's the LinkedIn echo chamber, right? Then there's the whole, there's, yeah, the academics. Like I'm in safety a decade. I only found out about the fucking academics about three or four years ago. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like it isn't covered in our educational roots. It's not covered in courses. So there's there's all that there's that whole clusterfuck that needs to be sorted. And that's and like that's from people who are choosing to go into the profession and even they can't yeah. find out about it. So how do we expect anybody else who doesn't want to engage and doesn't want to know about it to know about the different approaches or whatever it is, let alone, let alone, like you say, yeah. the actual and, basic legislation stuff. And who's going to get to decide what goes in? So if we said, you're right, we need to change the curriculum there wouldn't be much controversy about what goes in, would there? Mm. <laughs> like, seriously. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, it would be enormous. Mm. Um, and, and even, even so, so we, um, Australia, I'm not sure if you caught the end of this on your way out or if you've paid attention to it, Elizabeth, the whole industrial manslaughter conversation over here. Yeah, I've been keeping an eye on it, yeah. All right. There has been no debate about whether it's good for safety or not. <laughs> okay. Now, I, look, I I acted for the only person in WA who's gone to jail for a breach of safety legislation. Okay. Do you know what has changed as a concept? So this happens. So the first time someone gets a custodial sentence, two years, two months, eight months served as a term of imprisonment, taken out of the court on a plane, Kalgoorlie Maximum Security Prison, ends up in a prison farm for eight months. Right. Sixty years old. This happens. What has changed as a consequence of that in terms of fatalities in Western Australia? Nothing. Nothing. Mm. Most people don't even know about the case. The magistrate in the case actually said, because we, we, we pleaded guilty, there wasn't a lot we could do, but the written reasons for decision, neither the prosecution nor the defendant could, could advise the court why the work was performed the way it was on the day. So this idea of, you know, it's a, 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 a 25-year-old kid's died, 22-year-old kid being seriously injured. Okay, how did we get to a position that the work was being done like this? That's not a conversation that happens in a prosecution. So what's the point? Well, the point is retributive justice. The victims of those crimes feel that their family's lives or that their loved one's life needs to mean something. And I... I, I at an intellectual level, I get that. I've never lost anybody in a workplace accident, so it's hard to really connect with that. I imagined if it happened to me, I'd be absolutely traumatised. But what we don't have is any sort of intelligent conversation about is that a good way to get better safety outcomes? But, like, you could take this to even outside of safety. Of course you could. At a societal level, yeah. does... Like, mm-hmm. does our judicial system work? I knew it's going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Does incarcerating people work? Like, lads, you know, you know, youth crime. Burn it all down and start yeah. again. What's, like, what's a good answer to youth crime? Yeah. You fucking lock them up. Like, what? Like, it just doesn't, none of it works. None of it, it's broken. And it's broken everywhere. But, uh, and, and yeah, and now I've gone, it's too, it's too big. It's overwhelming. Yeah. So, until until the zombies come. Because I can get stuck <laughs> so into that. But yeah, to zoom to zoom back out, it is, and yeah. and I think that the, a really interesting lens there, Greg, is like yeah, you could say let's tear up all the theory and all the book and all the legislation. It's the same dudes or women that would be writing it again anyway. It's the mm. same echo chamber that would create it. Yeah, lot of the it's a bit of that. Um, and I'm sorry. And I, so I, I was just, and I was just thinking actually, you're probably the first person ever to make me actually think, fuck, this is why I should be reading it all. 
because it's the same people in the bubble making the comments, doing the changing, all of yeah. that. Stuff, and there isn't anybody, or there, there is, but there, yeah, there is a responsibility. I suddenly feel very, that a responsibility to, Elisa, we had a really good discussion about safety science, didn't we? Mm. And I was just like, yeah. well, why, would I, like why would I bother? I was like, why would I bother ah! safety science? And you were like, listen, <laughs> <laughs> how about... But- having never implemented something you know doesn't work because it's been disproved. I was like, oh, that's helpful. Now that's helpful. That's helpful. Um, and that's Well, disproved. Yeah, yeah. Oh, don't, don't fucking start now. Don't. Yeah, help me out. What? Very one. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? Well, if you're a, if you're a, you're a, um, you've got an industrial, industrial fruit market, right? And you're the health and safety advisor of an industrial fruit market and it's, it's full of, um, uh, immigrant workers, yeah, right, and we've got that. We've we've got a we've got a um a program in Australia with the South Pacific Islands. There's a special visa for. I think this is right, and if I'm wrong, please don't burn me down. But you know, it, it, similar products all over, similar programs all over the world. So South Pacific Islanders come to Australia, do fruit picking, do agricultural work, right? So you're the safety manager on on one of those large scale um, sort of agricultural properties. I mean, are you really having conversations about Taylorism? No. Right? <laughs> audience appropriate, though. Come on now. Like, audience appropriate. I don't think, just because it's not something you're going to have a discussion with the front line about doesn't mean, or fuck it, throw it out the, throw it out the window. No. I um, and I think as well, look, I suppose, Crystal, to your point about, like, it's this thing of, yeah, we look, we need to be doing something. And... To be fair to the likes of the people who are doing the due diligence index and all that, they are doing something. Um, And with the best intent, I am sure. And and this is the other thing. When we get into arguments, we all generally have the same outcome in mind is that we are improving the safety of work and reducing Mm. harm and all that stuff. We just get fucking tied up in knots about it. Yeah. Okay. Let me... So the response I've had to that, the the criticism, and I'm... Spoiler alert, there's a more detailed criticism of the whole thing coming, not just... <laughs> no, <yes. laughs> All right. But it's like, it's not perfect, but it, it's... Um, we need to move directions, right? Is it okay. an improvement? Well, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Okay. I, I have two problems with that. One is I don't think it can do what it says it does anyway, so I'm not sure it is an improvement. But leaving that aside... How many conversations have you had? I know I've had several where somebody says, we're introducing a hazard reporting program. We're not worried about the quality. We just want them to do it and then we will improve the quality later. And what happens? Fuck all. I've had so many conversations. Right? You say that right. and I'm like, oh. This is, this is that conversation at a board level. Okay, this doesn't fair. work. This doesn't work, but let's give it a crack. Because we can always change the we can always change the we'll board's later. mind later, right? You know how easy that's to ease to do. Mm. You know, because we, we get so many cracks at the board, we might as well just throw up one shit idea after another, and something will eventually work because they'll just change their mind when we ask them to. Okay, before we kind of start to wrap, because I'm conscious of time, there is something I did want to ask you about. Because in sure. that post that you wrote about the the DDI, you were saying like. It's like whatever about measurement, blah blah. blah. That's a direct quote. Um, that yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty accurate. They, you're like safety is a narrative. Yep. And then I commented underneath it. You didn't fucking write back. I was like, how rude. But I was like, Greg. I know. I knew I was going to talk to you. <laughs> I suspected this was coming. But who controls the narrative? So it's this like yep. it's kind of like you go, oh, a worker insight. Well, what's a worker insight? Oh, closed out. Well, who decides what closed closed out is? Who decides yep. what effective is? Like, yep. I guess what annoyed me was like, where does it end? Where do we? And I know it doesn't end, but like, at what point do you go? This is this this could work or this might be acceptable. When you go, oh, it's a narrative. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And yeah, so the how narrative? far you how can... far up your own backside do you actually want to disappear? Right. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, there's a case called Prospect Electricity in Western Australia, New South Wales, in Australia, New South Wales decision talks about the infinite regression of supervision, well-trained supervisors. Yeah. Supervising well-trained. So, yeah, so narrative with another narrative with another narrative with another narrative. I think the difference is 
If you have a senior accountable person, again, socioeconomic problem, we're assuming senior accountable person, right? Yep. Large organisation. Senior accountable person that says, here's the monthly board report or the quarterly or whatever it looks like. In the reporting period, or so there's an agreed um, narrative in the organisation about what the critical risks and crucial systems are that's been tested and worked through. This is what we think matters to the organisation. Dear board members, this is what we have done to get assurance that we've got the right systems in place and that they work. And here is my signature and this is my view of it, right? Then you have a very direct, very linear direct approach between the person who's saying this is what we've done and this is why we think it works and the people who are responsible for accepting or challenging that conversation, right? If you take something like a worker insight, what you have got is a green pressure gauge that is made up of a number of conversations per million hours worked multiplied by people's warm, fuzzy feelings coming out of some <laughs> fucking survey, adding together the number of corrective actions which may or may not have been agreed upon and decided to be implemented which may or may not have been successfully implemented just because there. somebody's ticked them and said they're implemented doesn't mean they're implemented. So the, the, the joining of the dots is not there. Yeah. And I, look, this is probably corrupted by, I, I've effectively been an advisor for 30 years. My job is to stand in front of people and say, this is what I've looked at. This is what I think it means. This is what I'm asking you to do as a consequence of that. And I spend my whole life being challenged on that. And that, and I think this is the missing piece because nowhere in this sort of stuff does it say, oh, by the way, this is valueless unless we can teach board members some safety literacy or safety intelligence so that they can actually question and challenge the material in front of them. Mm. That's the bit we're not doing, mm. I, I think. We're not... We're not teaching people to challenge and question and say, what does this actually mean? Yeah. In part, like there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that floats around it. Yeah, in terms but, of including permission to speak and actually a good conduit to, for those people that are educated enough to now answer questions, where do they put them, the fact they'll be trusted and also looked into. There's like 10 layers about that as well. Yeah. And I probably sound overly frustrated, and in some ways I am because... Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I had to, I, hands up, I had to go and get counselling after this bloke went to jail. I, I spent 18 months with his partner and his mum and his kids and yeah. la, da, 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 da. And this, so this bloke is not like a bloke who goes down to a pub and snots another fella or breaks into somebody's house. Yeah. You do that, you know, you've probably got a sense that, yeah, there's a legal consequence. This guy, this guy's been building sheds in remote and rural Western Australia for 30 years. He thought it was a genuine accident. He gave a voluntary record of interview to the regulator. It, you know, he, so had, he had no idea this was coming. Though. It was devastating. It was absolutely heartbreaking. As I say, I've got oh, nine fatalities on the go at the moment, and we've got all of these conversations and all of these industries that have been built up, and now there they, they are industries that have been built up on this, and and I'm not so naive as to suggest that you know the law is not a legal industry built up around this as well. Yes, of course we are. Right, I understand that, and yes, we're probably part of the problem. Um, but the the sorts of catastrophic events that distress people still occur yeah and there's a genuine conversation to be had have we done all we can mm. is is there is there a number that we can't get beyond or more importantly is all the noise that we're stirring up around this at the moment actually taking our eye off the ball and making things worse mm -hmm. we, we've we've had four deaths in a month in wa including a 16 year old kid the other day yeah. Right. Yeah. So the fact that we've we can send people to jail hasn't hasn't changed the baseline. No. And I I don't know. I think 
there's something missing. I don't know what it is. There's a lot smarter people than me out there, but I think fundamentally we're not paying enough attention to whether or not what we do actually works. I think we're just doing it. Mm. And I think the measure of success is whether it is done. That the measure of success of a take five is a take five has been done, not whether the boys and girls understand the risk. Yeah, it's compliance. And I think, Did the thing and, and this is where I'm concerned. So you take learning teams, I don't care how big a fan you are, the, the, the likelihood that the success of learning teams will be measured by the fact that a learning team has been done as opposed to any other aspect of it is high because that's what history tells us is probably going to happen. I think it comes back to one of the points that sort of run through this whole pod though, isn't it? It's nothing about the intent behind running a learning team. The intent is I want to do a good thing and I want to find out what happens. But as a profession, we just sort of industrialize it and we make it a compliance tool and then we measure the thing as opposed to the yeah. outcome. Um, as we did with five wise and ICAM and Kelvin yeah. Topset and Tripod Alpha Beta and Delta and uh, what's the other one? Taproot. Yeah. Pick your tool, stick a process on it, count the process. The the purpose of it goes away. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big Seems to be. non fan of that. Oh, amazing. Well, I, I, I'll tell you, I'm definitely, definitely not ready to. I could have this conversation. Like I could go happily for hours. Um, so if you ever except that to... I'm just about to tell you, it's time to wrap. It's time you to wrap. can't. It's time to wrap it up. Um, well, that was uplifting, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know what though? If you ever want to come back in and, and carry on the conversations, because we didn't even really get. Although I suppose it's a theme. It's been a theme through it. That whole um, purpose process. You know yeah. that that whole um, that whole area. Are they linked? Are we? You know. Do we stick to, do we just lay a, well, you mentioned that process there. We get something with good intent, we stick a process on it, we just measure the process. So no, we are not uh, staying true yeah. to the purpose of what we're doing. Um, and, yeah, and and look, I'm sure, and I don't doubt for a moment, there are pockets of excellence everywhere. Yeah. Right, where, where people are true, we're true to it. I, I'm not, you know, again, I've, I've got 30 years of, of, of dead bodies and cynicism sort of piling up behind me, which is where that comes from, okay? Yeah. Um, but it does seem to be common mm. and it does seem to be a trap that all organisations very easily fall into. Um, and I guess I guess if there's a, me a message, if there's something we can take away from it, it is just be conscious that your good intentions can become um, a bureaucratic process disconnected mm. from from the purpose they were designed to achieve. And if you can just at least be aware that that could happen yeah, and ask yourself the question, is that happening? Um, it might help. Yeah. Amazing. Um, in, turn of, in terms of my rap thoughts, I, I've loved the conversation for sure. That whole thing about echo chamber has really stuck with me as well as the deviation yeah. from, from purpose. And the fact that what we do, actually do is you mentioned it before about educating boards or senior leaders about how to challenge. I think that's fundamentally the reason we get the measure wrong because essentially you have somebody above you um, who it probably isn't safety competent, who's just saying, I'm saying, I need to do this thing, a learning teams, I need to do this document. And they're going, great, yeah. I don't know it works. And you go, oh, well, you know, we'll check it and we'll do the thing. Um, and the traffic light's green. And the tra and, But then they say, cool, if that's how you're checking it, I will yeah. monitor the checking because actually it's down to you to stick to your purpose and why you brought these processes in. So that's that's definitely in my mind as a leader. Um, and the other thing in there about that echo chamber piece, I think one of the, my favourite things about Speak um, is that we don't ask people to come on Speak. And I think it's been subconscious, but some of that is because we would naturally lean out to the people that resonate with our own theories. It would be our own echo chamber if we mm. went and sought people that we were already interested in and agree with um and actually it's nice that it's people that sometimes you know they'll reach out or we've got somebody coming on recently that we both never knew that that diverse opinion those diverse thoughts are really important so i think that echo chamber pieces um is really really important um, just on that Chris, so i think what you guys are doing is important mm. 
I, mean, I think this is an important podcast in terms of what you talk about. Everything from God help me, menopause through to you know. No, I'm 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 not joking. It's there. It's important stuff. It it you know it's humanizing the whole area that we're trying to put a face to i think what you guys do is important that's why i asked to come on so i appreciate the opportunity amazing thank you and yeah then, thanks yeah. yeah um the and then the last bit before i hand over to elisa to do her reflections uh on this podcast um is oh i've lost it there yeah no it's gone it's gone 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 go gone, gone with the wind um uh yeah i suppose look to your point, thanks, Greg, for uh, being so complimentary about the pod. And look, yeah, that that is a big part of it, of humanizing the whole thing, humanizing ourselves, other professionals, mm. you know, yeah. like, and just opening up conversations. And I suppose to Crystal's point of people have been asking to come on. And while it's not quite echo chambery, they're still fairly, we're all still fairly on the same page. So shout out to anyone who'd love to come on and really give us a fucking go. Like, yes, like, come on, like. Let's let's get into it. Um, get Dom cool. Cooper. Get Dom Cooper on. Dom, I wonder is Dom listening? I don't know. I'll message him. Um, but uh, yeah, and I suppose other reflections. Um, I've I've really enjoyed it. I definitely think. Let's digest. Come back in a couple of months, part two, hundred um, percent. Um, because like that we could go for hours. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I could have one one tip just like i can't come up with any solid answers i just get overwhelmed the whole thing is massive and so that's my takeaway as well that's my yeah <laughs> i think that's a good i think that's the right reaction to have yeah, <laughs> yeah amazing yeah so brilliant so listen thanks a for coming on thanks everyone for listening and we will catch you next time uh with somebody else in the speak seat Thanks. Awesome. Bye. See ya. Bye. Thanks all. Thanks, guys.